Section eight of Kazan by James Oliver Curwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter eight The Great Change. The rocks, the ridges, and the valleys were taking on a warmer glow. The poplar buds were ready to burst. The scent of balsam and of spruce grew heavier in the air each day, and all through the wilderness, in plain and forest, there was the rippling murmur of the spring floods finding their way to Hudson's Bay. In that great bay there was the rumble and crash of the ice fields thundering down in the early break-up through the rose welcome the doorway to the arctic and for that reason there still came with the april wind an occasional sharp breath of winter kazan had sheltered himself against that wind not a breath of air stirred in the sunny spot the wolf-dog had chosen for himself he was more comfortable than he had been at any time during the six months of terrible winter and as he slept he dreamed gray wolf his wild mate lay near him, flat on her belly, her forepaws reaching out, her eyes and nostrils as keen and alert as the smell of man could make them. For there was that smell of man, as well as of balsam and spruce, in the warm spring air. She gazed anxiously and sometimes steadily at Kazan as he slept. Her own gray spine stiffened when she saw the tawny hair along Kazan's back bristle at some dream vision she whined softly as his upper lip snarled back showing his long white fangs but for the most part kazan lay quiet save for the muscular twitchings of legs shoulders and muzzle which always tell when a dog is dreaming and as he dreamed there came to the door of the cabin out on the plain a blue-eyed girl woman with a big brown braid over her shoulder who called through the cup of her hands, Kazan! 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 The voice reached faintly to the top of the sun rock, and Gray Wolf flattened her ears. Kazan stirred, and in another instant he was awake and on his feet. He leaped to an outcropping ledge, sniffing the air and looking far out over the plain that lay below them. Over the plain the woman's voice came to them again and Kazan ran to the edge of the rock and whined. Gray Wolf stepped softly to his side and laid her muzzle on his shoulder. She had grown to know what the voice meant. Day and night she feared it, more than she feared the scent or sound of man. Since she had given up the pack and her old life for Kazan, the voice had become Gray Wolf's greatest enemy, and she hated it. It took Kazan from her, and wherever it went, Kazan followed. Night after night it robbed her of her mate, and left her to wander alone under the stars and the moon, keeping faithfully to her loneliness, and never once responding with her own tongue to the hunt calls of her wild brothers and sisters in the forests and out on the plains. Usually she would snarl at the voice, and sometimes nip Kazan lightly to show her displeasure. But today, as the voice came a third time, she slunk back into the darkness of a fissure between two rocks, and Kazan saw only the fiery glow of her eyes. Kazan ran nervously to the trail their feet had worn up to the top of the sun rock, and stood undecided. All day, and yesterday, he had been uneasy and disturbed. Whatever it was that stirred him seemed to be in the air, for he could not see it, or hear it, or scent it. But he could feel it. He went to the fissure and sniffed at Grey Wolf. Usually she whined coaxingly, but her response today was to draw back her lips until he could see her white fangs. A fourth time the voice came to them faintly, and she snapped fiercely at some unseen thing in the darkness between the two rocks. Kazan went again to the trail, still hesitating. Then he began to go down. It was a narrow winding trail, worn only by the pads and claws of animals, for the sun rock was a huge crag that rose almost sheer up for a hundred feet above the tops of the spruce and balsam, 
its bald crest catching the first gleams of the sun in the morning, and the last glow of it in the evening. Gray Wolf had first led Kazan to the security of the retreat at the top of the rock. When he reached the bottom, he no longer hesitated, but darted swiftly in the direction of the cabin. Because of that instinct of the wild that was still in him, he always approached the cabin with caution. He never gave warning, and for a moment Joan was startled when she looked up from her baby and saw Kazan's shaggy head and shoulders in the open door. The baby struggled and kicked in her delight, and held out her two hands with cooing cries to Kazan. Joan, too, held out a hand. Kazan, she cried softly, come in, Kazan. Slowly the wild red light in Kazan's eyes softened. He put a forefoot on the sill and stood there, while the girl urged him again. Suddenly his legs seemed to sink a little under him, his tail drooped, and he slunk in with that doggish air of having committed a crime. The creatures he loved were in the cabin, but the cabin itself he hated. He hated all cabins, for they all breathed of the club and the whip and bondage. Like all sledge-dogs, he preferred the open snow for a bed, and the spruce-tops for shelter. Joan dropped her hand to his head, and at its touch there thrilled through him that strange joy that was his reward for leaving Grey Wolf and the wild. Slowly he raised his head until his black muzzle rested on her lap, and he closed his eyes while that wonderful little creature that mystified him so, the baby, prodded him with her tiny feet and pulled his tawny hair. He loved these baby maulings even more than the touch of Joan's hand. Motionless, sphinx-like, undemonstrative in every muscle of his body, Kazan stood, scarcely breathing. More than once this lack of demonstration had urged Joan's husband to warn her. But the wolf that was in Kazan, his wild aloofness, even his mating with Grey Wolf, had made her love him more. She understood and had faith in him. In the days of the last snow, Kazan had proved himself. A neighboring trapper had run over with his team, and the baby Joan had toddled up to one of the big huskies. There was a fierce snap of jaws, a scream of horror from Joan, a shout from the men as they leaped toward the pack. But Kazan was ahead of them all. In a gray streak that traveled with the speed of a bullet, he was at the big husky's throat. When they pulled him off, the husky was dead. Joan thought of that now as the baby kicked and tousled Kazan's head. "'Good old Kazan,' she cried softly, putting her face down close to him. "'We're glad you came, Kazan, for we're going to be alone tonight, baby and I. Daddy's gone to the post, and you must care for us while he's away.' She tickled his nose with the end of her long, shining braid. This always delighted the baby, for, in spite of his stoicism, Kazan had to sniff, and sometimes to sneeze, and twig his ears. And it pleased him, too. He loved the sweet scent of Joan's hair. "'And you'd fight for us if you had to, wouldn't you?' she went on. Then she rose quietly. "'I must close the door,' she said. "'I don't want you to go away again today, Kazan. You must stay with us.' Kazan went off to his corner and lay down. Just as there had been some strange thing at the top of the sun-rock to disturb him that day, so now there was a mystery that disturbed him in the cabin. He sniffed the air, trying to fathom its secret. Whatever it was, it seemed to make his mistress different, too. And she was digging out all sorts of odds and ends of things about the cabin, and doing them up in packages. Late that night, before she went to bed, Joan came and snuggled her hand close down beside him for a few moments. "'We're going away,' she whispered, and there was a curious tremble that was almost a sob in her voice. "'We're going home, Kazan. We're going away down where his people live, where they have churches and cities and music and all the beautiful things in the world. And we're going to take you, Kazan.' Kazan didn't understand but he was happy at having the woman so near to him and talking to him. At these times he forgot Grey Wolf. 
the dog that was in him surged over his quarter strain of wildness and the woman and the baby alone filled his world but after joan had gone to her bed and all was quiet in the cabin his old uneasiness returned he rose to his feet and moved stealthily about the cabin sniffing at the walls the door and the things his mistress had done into packages a low whine rose in his throat joan half asleep heard it and murmured be quiet kazan go to sleep go to sleep long after that kazan stood rigid in the centre of the room listening trembling and faintly he heard far away the wailing cry of gray wolf but to-night it was not the cry of loneliness it sent a thrill through him he ran to the door and whined but joan was deep in slumber and did not hear him once more he heard the cry and only once then the night grew still he crouched down near the door joan found him there still watchful still listening when she awoke in the early morning she came to open the door for him and in a moment he was gone his feet seemed scarcely to touch the earth as he sped in the direction of the sun rock across the plain he could see the cap of it already painted with a golden glow he came to the narrow winding trail and wormed his way up it swiftly gray wolf was not at the top to greet him but he could smell her and the scent of that other thing was strong in the air his muscles tightened his legs grew tense deep down in his chest there began the low rumble of a growl he knew now what that strange thing was that had haunted him and made him uneasy it was life something that lived and breathed had invaded the home which he and gray wolf had chosen he bared his long fangs and a snarl of defiance drew back his lips stiff-legged prepared to spring his neck and head reaching out he approached the two rocks between which gray wolf had crept the night before she was still there and with her was something else after a moment the tenseness left kazan's body his bristling crest drooped until it lay flat his ears shot forward and he put his head and shoulders between the two rocks and whined softly and the gray wolf whined slowly kazan backed out and faced the rising sun then he lay down so that his body shielded the entrance to the chamber between the rocks gray wolf was a mother end of chapter 8 of kazan by james oliver kerwood recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio